on this edition of It's a Miracle. Witness the terrifying story of a mother and her young child as they are struck by lightning. He had said that lightning had split her brain in two, all the way down to the middle of her skull, all the way from the front of her forehead, all the way to the back. See the mysterious circumstances that brought her back to life. Then, a man is trapped inside the cockpit of a burning plane. Can someone 2,000 miles away come to his rescue? A young woman struggles for her life as she is pulled out to sea by a deadly riptide. There is only one thing that can save her, but he can't see what is happening. Plus, an unexplained vision. She says, well, that's the lady who was in my dream. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I became real emotional about it. Discover the message that changed two lives forever. And a young boy is lost in the wilderness of the Colorado Rockies. Rescue teams know he is not equipped to survive through the night. All you can think about is he's out there, lost, he's cold, he could be dying. As the freezing temperatures weaken him, he wakes to find mysterious visitors. These extraordinary stories and more on It's a Miracle. Welcome to It's a Miracle. I'm Richard Thomas. And I'm Nia Peoples. Miracles are defined as incredible events that defy logical explanation. And that precisely describes the kinds of stories we'll be sharing with you tonight. Whether you believe in miracles or not, these stories will certainly make you wonder. And you'll hear them firsthand from the real people who experience them. People who are convinced that sometimes the world can work in miraculous ways. Kristen Gabrielson and Chris Nelson are engaged to be married. They both feel it is a miracle that not only brought them together, but actually saved their lives. You see, they formed a miraculous bond as the result of a matchmaker from heaven. In 1994, Megan Hickerson was a happy, vivacious 14-year-old, known among her friends and family for her tremendous enthusiasm for life. Every day was a delight with Megan because she always had us laughing. She was always in a good mood. She woke up sunny and stayed that way. And that was from the time that she was born. She was uh, the class clown and also the class president. Megan also loved to play matchmaker. Well, Megan liked everyone to be happy. When she saw people that she thought should be together, she would make it so. known. I think Jamie really likes you. I was talking to him last Stephanie week. Palmer was one of the recipients of Megan's matchmaking plans. Through ongoing church activities, Megan brought Stephanie together with Jamie, the church's youth director. She talked to Jamie and then did the high school thing where I would talk to her and then she'd go talk to Jamie and then come run back to me and tell me what he had said. Megan's matchmaking paid off. Stephanie and Jamie were later married, but sadly, Megan would not be there to share in their happiness. Hello. Late in the evening on January 14, 1995, oh my God. Connie and Jim Hickerson received horrifying news about their daughter. Oh my God. Megan had been involved in a tragic skiing accident. After driving for six hours, the Hickersons arrived at the University of Wisconsin Children's Hospital where Megan was being kept alive on a life support system. They basically told us that she was unconscious in uh, grave condition. And, and I remember at the time asking one of the uh, neurologists, I said, uh, what are we looking at? And he said, in 24 hours, it'll be over. And my response was, you mean she will be better in 24 hours? And he said, no, it will most likely be over in 24 hours. Megan had suffered massive head injuries. When Connie and Jim were finally permitted to see their daughter, she looked peacefully at rest. But Connie's instincts told her otherwise. Deep in my heart, I knew. I was hopeful, but I knew that she would be gone. I turned to Jim and I said, 
we've just lost our baby. Sadly, Connie's maternal instincts proved true. During Megan's final hours, doctors asked the Hickersons about the possibility of donating Megan's organs. Connie's reaction was negative until she talked with Jim. He said, Connie, think about if that was Megan lying there waiting for a heart or something that would save her life and the person in the next room could save her life. What would you do? What would you think? And I looked at him and I said, I guess I'd be praying somebody would make the decision to donate the organs. And at that point, we agreed. The Hickersons were unaware at the time, but two people were hoping that someone would make a decision to donate organs. Kristen Gabrielson's life depended on finding a new set of lungs. Chris Nelson desperately needed a liver transplant. The emergency session of multiple transplant operations using Megan Hickerson's organs saved the lives of four people, including Kristen and Chris. Megan's parents' decision to donate her organs made it possible for others to live. But even in death, the matchmaker in Megan's spirit continued to flourish. A year after meeting in 1995 at an organ transplant symposium, the two recipients met again at a bowling fundraiser and began dating. There, a romance began to bloom. I think it was comforting for both of us to talk to each other, and after a while, we just, we just kind of fell in love. I think it was a sense of humor. It was the tone in his voice, his understanding of what I had gone through. Um, because anybody on the outside, so to speak, wouldn't, wouldn't really be able to relate to anything that I had gone through. On January 16, 1998, the third anniversary of their organ transplants, Chris and Kristen became engaged. Through an astounding series of events, the spirit of a young woman full of life continues to live on in a divinely inspired romance. I would have to say it was a miracle because there, there were so many things um, that, that I shouldn't have been able to make it through and did. And the same one for Kristen too. Even in this tragedy of her death, she did this ultimate match made in heaven kind of a thing and, um, and she brought Chris and I together. Megan, uh, the matchmaker she was, I think, I think she's looking down from above and uh, having a big ha-ha-ha uh, about the whole thing because uh, I think she's the one that's really responsible. Next on It's a Miracle, a blind dog becomes the unexpected hero in a tense life and death situation. And later, a plane crashes hundreds of miles from civilization and the two men on board find themselves in the middle of an inferno when It's a Miracle continues. It's common knowledge that animals have heightened senses. They can see farther, hear higher registers, and pick up a scent from miles away. But do they possess a sixth sense? Well, I know one young woman who would be the first to give you an emphatic yes, and this is why. If it wasn't for the courageous, even miraculous act of a yellow Labrador oh, retriever here. named Norman, Lisa Nibley might not be alive today. Now well, we have two dogs. In 1993, Annette McDonald of Seaside, Oregon, rescued Norman from an animal shelter when he was just a year old. Abandoned by his original owners, he had already been held two days longer than usual and was scheduled to be put to sleep the very next morning. But Annette sensed there was something special about the dog. I knew I wanted to get Norman right away. You want to go home with me? Huh? Norman started barking at us like he knew he was supposed to go with us. He was just coming unglued. Not long after Annette brought Norman home, she realized that something was terribly wrong with him. He's bumping into things during the daytime now. and he's Norman was losing his drunk. eyesight. The veterinarian diagnosed his problem as retinal atrophy. There was no cure permanent problem, it's going to eventually lead to blindness. 
Within months, Norman lost his sight completely. But Norman took his blindness in stride. Norman was able to adjust to his eyesight really well. Norman, Norman, come, come here. He was still the same happy, enthusiastic dog that everybody loved. The blindness limited Norman's mobility, but on the open beach near the McDonald's home, he could still run free. The nearby Nicanicum River is a tidal estuary. Its outlet to the Pacific is a trickle at low tide, but when the tide comes in, it fills up like a bay. In July of 1996, 15-year-old Lisa Nibley and her younger brother Joe arrived on vacation. They had visited this beach every summer for the past three years. Both were excellent swimmers, and their parents trusted they could handle themselves in the waters. But today, the tide was changing, and as the cold ocean water rushed upstream, Lisa and Joe found themselves pulled into deeper and deeper water. A current started to form, and it um, got deeper and I remember I got pushed away from my brother and all of a sudden it dropped off and the river got deep and I couldn't touch the bottom. No, I can't touch Their playful shouts soon turned to screams of terror, cries that no one could possibly hear. It started to pull me under and I was swimming against the current to get back and I got really tired and I was screaming at the top of my lungs. Joe made it to safety on the opposite shore and watched helplessly as a powerful current carried Lisa upstream. Billy, help me. I kept going under and then I'd get back up and I'd scream and um, I remember actually I did say a prayer to, to God when I was, I said, please don't let this happen to me. Meanwhile, Annette McDonald was bringing Norman down to the beach from her nearby home but it was very unusual for Annette to be there at that time of day. It was Monday morning and I didn't want to go to work, so my husband Steve told me to stay home and I was just about ready to sit down and read a book and for some reason I looked at Norman and said, oh, let's go for a walk. All of a sudden he cocked his head and started barreling down the beach and I'd never seen him run like that before. The blind dog raced over 150 yards down the beach. Over the roar of the water, he had heard something that no human ear could detect. Guiding on Lisa's voice, Norman fearlessly paddled straight toward the drowning girl. I know some swim swimming to me. I realize that everything's gonna be okay. I'm, I'm gonna be all right. But when she stopped screaming, Norman lost his bearings. By now, Lisa's strength was gone, and she began to be swept away. I started hyperventilating. I wasn't breathing well, and I got really weak. From the shore, Annette desperately yelled out to her, telling her to call Norman's name. He'll help you. His name's Norman. Norman! Norman didn't stop until he reached the voice. Lisa managed to grab onto him, and he towed her back toward the sound of Annette's voice and safety. When Lisa came out of the water, I just hugged her and wanted her to know that she was safe. And she, she was trying to be so brave, and she just said, you must be my guardian angel. And I said, no, Norman, you're guardian angel. News of his heroics traveled quickly. People magazine put Lisa and Norman on their cover. Oh, that was good. But to those close to him, Norman is much more than just a hero. Miraculously, his blindness did not prevent him from saving a drowning girl. I knew that he was my guardian angel, that someone had sent him to save me. It really was a miracle how it all came together. I think maybe God does that to get your attention and maybe to humble us a little. For Lisa, the experience prompted her to express her feelings in song. Your eyes know the 
cannot see me I feel as if they know me I think I take things more seriously now. I don't just let things fly by. I just know that my life is important because if it wasn't, I wouldn't be here. And I owe my life to you. Coming up on It's a Miracle, a freak accident of nature, and the unbelievable story that follows. And later, a young boy lost in the wilderness of the Colorado Rockies fights to survive the night in freezing temperatures until he wakes to discover mysterious visitors. When It's a Miracle continues. It's a miracle. The awesome power contained in a single bolt of lightning is terrifying. It can rip a tree in half, even shatter solid stone. It isn't hard to imagine the damage it can do when it strikes a human being. Lightning. It's one of the most powerful and terrifying forces of nature. Every year, more than 100 people are struck and killed by lightning. Although the chances of being hit are only one in millions, the chances of survival are even less. We're gonna drop Dad's watch off and get it repaired. On a warm summer fire. day in 1983, Renee Smith left stuff. her home in Lincolnton, Georgia for what she thought would be a normal trip to the shopping mall. Um, Jessica was sitting in the front seat and the baby was in the back seat in the car seats. Jessica was fixing to start kindergarten, so I went to get some school clothes and just to have something to do. The temperature was around 105 degrees that day, and it was cloudy, but I didn't think about a thunderstorm. We had just moved from the mountains of North Carolina, and uh, I hadn't encountered lightning like we see it here. As Renee pulled into the parking lot, a torrential rain began to pour. We were talking about if she was nervous going to school and what she wanted to buy, and uh, it was just a typical day. And that's the last thing I remember. Thirty thousand volts of electricity hit Renee's car, striking her in the head and tearing into her right temple. The sheer force of the lightning bolt threw young Jessica to the ground, frightened but not injured, and baby Sarah escaped unharmed. By the time paramedics arrived on the scene, bystanders had already begun CPR on Renee. EMT Paul Watson found her totally lifeless. Renee was in a condition that was very close to biological death. She was clinically dead. Renee was initially resuscitated after she was moved to the ambulance. Everybody clear? Clear. Clear. Renee wasn't breathing, and the only thing keeping her alive was an artificial respirator. We had no idea of what kind of damage um, her brain had sustained as a result of the lightning strike. She was rushed to a local hospital. Her heart was beating on its own, but she had no signs of consciousness. She had no eye movement. She had no signs of life whatsoever. When Renee's husband, Fred, arrived at the hospital, he found his wife on life support. The doctor explained that her injuries were so severe, she had almost no chance of survival. He had said that lightning had split her brain in two all the way down to the middle of her skull, all the way from the front of her forehead, all the way to the back. The extent of her injuries left Renee in critical condition with no sign of improvement. Two days later, while relatives and neighbors held a prayer vigil outside her room, Renee's friend Don Fletcher experienced something he'll never forget. And when I felt their presence, I saw them three figures come up out of the floor and I didn't realize what they were to start with until they started going to the wall and I could see that it was angelic beings. I figured they were guardian angels and the main purpose was to save her life. Later, Renee's husband learned about this incredible event. I knew her condition, but I knew God was doing something miraculous. And I was excited about that. The next day, when Fred arrived at the hospital, he found Renee conscious and off life support. 
She looked up at me and she said, what did I have, a boy or a girl? I said, you've not had any boy or girl. I said, you were hit by lightning. He told her that at one point she had been declared clinically dead. And I said, I was dead. I don't remember anything. It was like I was in a deep sleep, a real peaceful deep sleep. Doctors still cannot explain Renee's miraculous recovery, but her friends and family firmly believe that a force even more powerful than lightning brought her back to life. She's a walking, breathing miracle. In fact, her, her, her young daughter uh, is a living, breathing miracle too. Both of them are. Today, when Renee and her family look back on their horrifying experience, they feel a sense of peace and protection. And Renee, once given up for dead, has a new and profound sense of the power of miracles. I've always believed in miracles. I just didn't realize that, you know, I could have one, I guess. And then when it happened to me, I realized that miracles happen to everyday people. Coming up next on It's a Miracle. A small plane crashes hundreds of miles from civilization, and the two men on board find themselves in the middle of a raging inferno and a miracle. And later, a mysterious dream and the message that changed one woman's life. All that and more when It's a Miracle continues. Our next story is an extraordinary tale of survival that takes place in a wilderness so distant and remote that when disaster strikes, no one can possibly come to the rescue. And yet someone does. But who? And how? Many people are afraid to fly in small planes. They're light, fragile, and unstable in bad weather. But in Alaska, with its great stretches of raw wilderness, people depend on these planes for everyday transportation, always trusting that cautious flying will see them through. But as one man from Anchorage discovered, sometimes it takes more than caution to survive a disaster in the Alaskan outback. It began as a hunting and fishing adventure. Scott Weber and his friend pilot Gary Franklin had flown a bush plane hundreds of miles from civilization to try their luck in the wilderness. The site was so remote that the only place to land or take off was a narrow river sandbar. Bad weather had set in and they decided to leave early. Violent and unpredictable winds meant that every pound of weight could mean the difference between life and death during takeoff so Gary took great care in loading the plane. Because a, a, an airplane's ability to fly depends upon how heavy the airplane is, uh, and because his runway was so short, they decided to make the airplane as light as I possibly could. Gary was so concerned about the plane's weight that he gave Scott a chance to stay behind, offering to ferry the equipment out first and return for him later. I really wanted to get back home, so I told him no, I wanted to go with him. To me, it was another takeoff and landing. I trusted Gary's ability and his, and his flying, and, and I took all that into consideration. The plane lifted off normally, and for a brief moment, Gary and Scott thought they were safely airborne. I just pulled back on the stick, and the airplane uh, gently came up into the sky. And uh, then all of a sudden, just, just fell out of the sky, landed into the river. As we were skidding, there was an explosion at the same time. It was just like one big jolt, but you didn't really pay attention to that because you're on fire. As the plane ground to a halt on a rocky sandbar, the situation looked hopeless. The flame started uh, spreading the moment we hit the sandbar. Basically, the whole airplane was just engulfed in flames. Pretty soon the whole cockpit's filled with smoke, uh, fire, it was hot. Um, you just, nothing that you ever want to ever feel. You, you imagine yourself burning your finger while well, time's at by like 200. Gary tumbled from the plane within seconds of landing and ran for the water. But Scott, unable to unfasten his seatbelt, fought the flames as long as he could. I couldn't move, I was 
strapped in. I couldn't feel anything because my hands were being burned. I just leaned up. I was ready to die. Suddenly, a mysterious force seemed to take physical control of Scott's body. I felt the seat belt break loose. I felt a pull, and it was just like somebody pulling you. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything. It was just a, a, just, a, just the slightest motion just pulling me that way. The next thing Scott remembers, he was standing next to the plane in shock as Gary threw him to the ground to put out his flames. Finally, Gary dragged him to the river where he doused him with water. When Scott tried to thank Gary for helping him out of the plane, he found he owed his life to someone or something else. I said, thanks for pulling me out of the plane. And he told me he, he didn't have nothing to do with it. He never pulled me out. What was this mysterious force that pulled Scott Weber out of his safety belt and out of a burning plane? Could it be related to his mother's experience more than 2,000 miles away in Aberdeen, South Dakota? Donna Weber woke up with a start. Well, it was just like a sudden bolt. Uh, my eyes just kind of popped open, and I just knew that there was trouble and that there was something wrong. And I knew it was about Scott because before that I had been uh, dreaming about him. Donna sensed that her son desperately needed help, but he was thousands of miles away. So Donna did the only thing she could. She looked for guidance. So I just knelt by the side of the bed and said my prayer to protect Scott and to take care of him. Is a son alive today because of his mother's desperate plea for help? Both men sustained burns over 50% of their bodies, yet in spite of doctors' predictions, they survived and recovered. Scott believes the answer to the mystery is a simple one. I've always believed in miracles, and I just didn't think that one was ever gonna happen to me. People say that there's guardian angels uh, watching over them and uh, it just happens that mine is on the ground and lives in South Dakota. Coming right up on It's a Miracle. A rescue team searches through the night in the Colorado high country for a young boy lost in the freezing darkness. Discover his mysterious visitors next on It's a Miracle. Very few people can explain the mysterious behavior of some animals, and even fewer can explain what you're about to see. It's the story of a boy who nearly dies in the woods and is saved by the very animals he set out to hunt. The Eagle's Nest Wilderness Area in Colorado's Rocky Mountain National Forest is known for its rugged beauty. But among search and rescue teams like Patty and Dan Burnett, it is also known for its dangerous and unpredictable changes of climate. The weather can change dramatically, especially when you get above 10,000 feet. You can be on one side of the mountain and you're heading up toward the ridge and suddenly you get to the top of the ridge and you see the storm coming in from a distance and in no time at all, you can be in big trouble. In 1992, an amazing event would occur in these mountains, something even more unpredictable than the weather. The great nesting area just over that ridge there. Derek Patton and his young son Ryan had visited the mountains for a day of hunting. But sometime in the morning, Ryan became separated from his father. As hours passed, the temperature fell. Derek's fear grew, for his son had been dressed in only light summer clothing. Ryan! Around about 3 o'clock, I decided that uh, I better go down and get uh, someone up here to help search. And you're sure that this is his boot? Yeah, that's his boot, for sure. Great. We're going to go ahead and start him right now, then. Patty and Dan um, and Burnett were alerted by the local sheriff's right department here. and arrived in the remote area with their search dog, Hasty, and plenty of warm clothing. When they learned that Ryan had been dressed for summer when he disappeared, one terrifying word stuck in their minds, hypothermia. Hypothermia is a really insidious thing. People can die in the summertime with hypothermia as well as in the winter. All that has to happen with the human body is that your 
core temperature drop a few degrees and your body will shut down and you'll die. Ryan! After hours of searching, there was still no sign of Ryan. Ryan! And to add to the nightmare, snow began to fall. There's no way that he's in this quadrant here. What do you think, Scott? No, I, I don't think he's in here. I, I really hope he found a place to shelter tonight because I don't think we're going to find him this evening. All right, I'll With hope fading, the, the search had to be called off for the night. Hard to just sit and wait because all you can think about is he's out there, lost, he's cold, he could be dying. He couldn't have gone over the ridge and made yeah, that much of a right. mistake. So the next morning, Patty and Dan ridge. were joined by another we, veteran tracker, Greta Sloan, so and her dog, what Cello. Do? Ryan! Cello did pick up the scent fairly quickly, I suppose maybe after 30 minutes. And I followed him down the hill. Um, and he, he outstripped me, and when I got to the bottom of the hill and got within sight of him, there he was. I offered him water, I gave him some food, and at that point, he was indeed in a, in a dangerous state of hypothermia. There was no earthly reason why this boy should be alive, but two mysterious patches of melted snow nearby caught Greta's attention. While they waited for help to arrive, Ryan shared his miraculous story of survival. Dad! I was pretty scared. I didn't know what was gonna happen. Dad! Not having anybody else out there to answer. I could hardly talk. My throat was so Dad! sore from hollering that by night, I just had to, I knew I had to just stop and, and take it easy for a while. Terrified, alone, and freezing, Ryan knew he needed to find shelter. By that time, I knew that I couldn't see where I was going, so I'd walked over to the, where there were some bigger trees, and there was a fir tree that the branches went almost all the way to the ground. So I climbed underneath that so that I had, I'd have as much cover as I could. Exhausted, Ryan fell asleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, a strange noise woke him. As his eyes adjusted to the dark, he saw that there were two large elk nearby. Go away! He tried throwing sticks and pine cones to chase them away, but they kept coming back. Each time they returned, they came closer and closer. Finally, they did something that goes against the very nature of wild animals. They laid down next to the boy and stayed with him throughout the night. They lay close enough to him all night to keep him warm. And that is how he survived. Rescuers were skeptical of Ryan's story until they saw the area where the young boy had slept. The ground was thawed where two large animals had bedded down. He would have been dead if it wouldn't have been for the extra heat source of two big animals laying down beside him. I believe his story is true. And one of the reasons I believe it is because I think it's totally impossible for him to have survived if it weren't. It's OK, Ryan. It's safe now. Most parents would do anything to protect their child, and no one would call it a miracle. But when wild animals show the same care and concern for a human child, the word miracle seems appropriate. The time that we have on this earth is, is an interesting time, and, and it was obviously not Ryan's time to go, because a miracle came to bear. That, that's why he's still around. I mean, I've heard of angels being disguised as humans, so I don't know why angels couldn't be disguised as elk. Next on It's a Miracle. An unexplained vision in the middle of the night. Find out the message that changed two lives forever. When It's a Miracle continues. Can a love be so strong that it transcends time and space and even death? To answer that question, you only have to look at the lives of two lonely people. 
brought together by what they believe was a heavenly vision. This is their story. And it's up to you to decide whether it was just a dream or a miracle. The personal ads. They contain thousands of stories of lonely people looking for love, and at least one story that could be a miracle. It all began in 1973 with a dream, a vision of a mysterious red-haired lady seated at a church organ. I want you to place a personal ad, and this is what I wanted to say. The dreamer was Chris Henry, a young woman living in St. Petersburg, Florida. Although the words of the woman in the dream made no sense, Chris was compelled to write them down. The next day, Chris's employer found the note and asked Chris about it. And she said, she came out and she said, what's this? I said, it was just a dream of this lady. She was telling me to write this ad and to put it into a, pu uh, publish it into a paper. And uh, I said, just leave it next to my bed. It's just a dream, don't worry with it. But Chris's boss took matters into her own hands and sent the note to the local classifieds. A few nights later, the persistent figure returned to Chris's dreams. This time, her message was even more specific. Respond only to the typewritten letter. The next day, Chris told her boss about the second encounter. I said, guess what? I had another dream about that pretty lady with the red hair in front of the organ. She told me to only respond to the typewritten letter. And Doris started laughing because she said, well, I put it in publication. Two weeks later, a large envelope arrived with over 65 responses to the personal ad. To Chris's amazement, there was only one typewritten letter. It was from Jim Kelly. I actually wrote it out first, and then I typed it after a well. It'll look more professional. And, uh, uh, those type columns, you're a little leery anyway. If it comes in as a type letter, uh, possibility you yeah, have a chance, you know, uh, that person will talk to you. And that's what I did. After several telephone conversations, Chris and Jim finally made a date to go dancing. When I first saw her, you know, it was just, she was so beautiful. And uh, I said, well, <laughs> this will be a one-shot date, because, you know, I said, I'm not going to be able to compete with this. When I saw him, he was the most romantic-looking man I'd ever seen in my life. There was something there It was almost like a spiritual connection, because uh, everything just clicked almost like a soulmate type situation you'd found somebody you were know, very attracted to. If he would have said, do you want to marry me? I'd say yes, right then and there. And that's how I felt. Chris and Jim fell deeply in love and were married three years later. The newlywed couple was very aware that a miraculous sequence of events had brought them together. But there is one more incredible event in their story. While visiting Jim's mother, Chris paged through a family album when she noticed a photograph that took her breath away. There was the woman with the red hair looking right at me, and I said, that's her. That's the lady in my dream. She's the one that told me what to say. Another photograph showed the same woman standing next to Jim. Chris was shocked and asked Jim who she was. Chris had mentioned, she says, well, that's the lady that was in my dream. And, uh, you know, I became real emotional about it. As I said, that's, you know, that's my wife died of cancer. Unknown to Chris, Jim's first wife, Georgia, had lost a difficult battle with cancer, and Jim had been silently mourning her loss. Chris's dream when she had mentioned that she saw the woman sitting in Oregon, that was kind of a confirmation for me in my own thoughts because uh, Georgia uh, used to play in church organ. Chris felt an immediate connection to Jim's deceased wife. The love that I had for this woman, it was an honor to be directed and led by her and to be picked by her to be with Jim. Both Jim and Chris were convinced that her dreams were a message of love and proof that miracles do happen. 
I think this happened because Georgia basically wanted me to continue on in a relationship and not just wander in the desert like the nomads. I guess she knew that I would be his best friend. I would take care of him and make sure that he was loved and that's all he would ever know. This story definitely, as a miracle itself, demonstrates that you know love goes beyond the grave. It still continues. Her influence has been there with us all these years. Uh, they had a very special marriage. And to know that I'm, I'm handpicked by spirit, you can't get better than that. All walks of life have miraculous moments. Here are just a few. During the 1950s, when I was an airline hostess, uh, we had a flight from Chicago, from San Francisco to Chicago, and I had a feeling that I should not be on that airplane, so I called in sick. That flight was always, always full. This night, I did not choose to fly, and I was not on the plane. Several days later, the girl that I was on the plane with called me to tell me that there had been a terrible accident. The tail cone of the plane had come off, and everything had flown out of the plane. The blankets, the towels, the pillows, everything had snapped and blown out of the plane. This particular flight, there were only 13 passengers, not the normal full load, and um, nobody was hurt and nothing happened, so other people also must have felt the reason not to get on that plane as I did. And my miraculous story was when I was born, the bridge was stuck six feet up and six feet across, and the, the water was about 100 feet down. So the bridge was stuck and the hospital was on the other side of the island. And the only way to get across the Atlantic City and Brigantine Bridge was this one, this one bridge here. So they had to hoist my mom and myself across. And she, had, she was in heavy labor. She uh, broke her water. And she was, she was ready to, to uh, have me. And they hoisted my mom and I on a stretcher. And uh, the newspaper article the next day read, Stork Leaps Bridge. We hope you've been touched and inspired by the stories you've seen here tonight, and we have many more in store for you. Join us next time for more stories that prove that good things can happen despite overwhelming odds. And if you ever find yourself at a loss to explain something extraordinary that's happened to you, well, you're not alone. You just might have been touched by a miracle. Good night, everybody. See you next time.